The Tour de France may be behind us for another year, but one thing you can rely on to keep your company is Ask GC Anything. I took a nod from last week's edition from Cy and Dan, and I'm going to include just a little bit more rapid fire. Quite simply, because so many of you take the time to get in touch, we're going to return the favour and answer some more questions for you. But first up is this long form answer or question from Joshua Pierce, who asked, hashtag talkback, how do I become a professional biker or race for a team? Well, first and foremost, thanks very much for getting in touch, Joshua. Um, fundamentally, in the first instance, you just need to love riding your bike. Secondly, try and hook up with a like-minded group of, of riders locally, uh, but I think ultimately you want to join a cycling team or a local club. And they'll basically give you an opportunity to ride with a group, one of the most important skills if you're going to consider racing in the first place. And then what you need to do is get yourself in some races. And at your age, at 16, most of the racing that you were doing, aside from any time trials that you may choose to do, is to race on a closed circuit. And then if you really want to turn pro, you need to start performing well in these races and build up, stay focused, get plenty of rest, make sure you keep enjoying riding your bike, but improve your race craft, including improve your fitness and expose yourself to more different sorts of racing. And actually, it's a good idea to do some mountain biking as well, maybe a little bit of cyclocross to get as versatile as you can. And all basically through the age classification through the junior and under 23, you need to keep improving. And if you want to be a pro, you need to win some races. And if you start winning races on a national level, you'll then get picked up ultimately by the national team, and then you'll take it to the next level, which is riding internationally in the bigger races. And it's there that if you're good enough, if you win, for example, you'll catch the eye of professional team managers. But work hard, rest a lot, and enjoy riding your bike. And also, cheer on the cake, how about watching this video? Do not worry if you do not have the best equipment. Now I know that for a lot of us, many of us in fact, actually looking at and lusting after expensive bikes is part of being a cyclist. But if you don't have an expensive bike, then don't worry because it is the rider and not the bike that makes the biggest difference. Just look after what you've got, keep it clean, keep it well maintained and to be fair, if you get good results consistently, someone's probably going to start giving you bikes for free anyway. Next up, we have this question from Danny down in the uh, comment section at Bobo underscore Wyoming. Um, I did a biomechanical analysis and he said that I'm pedaling really bad, but I've been doing it for so long. How can I improve it? Well, Danny, thank you very much for getting in contact with us. Uh, but firstly, don't worry, because many people have built up techniques over the years because simply just got on a bike and started riding without really giving any particular thought to the way that they're riding. And if you think about it, if something is comfortable, especially riding a bike, why would you ever change? Now, it's amazing how adaptable the human body is. And regardless of the position that somebody's riding on a bike, you can actually get remarkably efficient, even in an incorrect biomechanical position. But you can still make improvements and you, stand, you can still change. Now, I wasn't, wasn't obviously there. We don't know the exact details of how badly you're pedaling or if you've got an incorrect position. But first and foremost, if there are positional changes that have been asked of you, make sure you do those incrementally and over time. Don't do any big positional shifts or any sudden positional shifts because that could result in bad knees, for example, or even a bad back. But you can get more efficient. Now, in relation particularly to pedaling technique, what you want to do is think while you're on the bike about how you pedal. Think about the muscles that you're recruiting and ultimately think about making smooth, fluid pedal strokes. Now this is a subject that we tackle in a lot more detail. Here, there's Dan, there's Cy, riding along the coast in California. Give this a watch, hopefully it'll help. First up, we're actually going to do some backpedaling. Not literally, but metaphorically, because an overwhelming body of research, including our own, has shown that pulling up on the pedals, scraping through the bottom of the pedal stroke, does not make your pedaling more efficient. No, your body will naturally put power to the pedals in the most efficient way for it, so you do not have to think about pedaling in circles. As promised, I've gone for a longer rapid fire round, hopefully not longer in the way I answer the questions, it's just that I've got nine here, so I'm gonna pack a load in. First up is this from Ollie Cook in the comment section who asked, where do the riders go when they abandon? Do they just have to sit in the car until the end? I feel you guys are qualified to answer. A little bit cheeky there, Ollie, but no, you are right. They will sit in the team car, but if the team car's full, more often they will actually go and sit in the broom wagon, which is the last vehicle 
on a race. I have been in the broom wagon a couple of occasions uh, when I've been feeling a bit dodgy. But basically what you'll do, you pull to the side of the road, race commissaire will take off your number and you'll either have to sit in the car or you're going to sit in the last vehicle on the race. Next up is this from Kevin Gunnerman who asks, when pedaling the bike, is it normal when you ha to have some inwards movement of your knee or should it be straight up and down movement only? Well, Kevin, uh, we're all built biomechanically differently, skeletally. So once you get on a bike and start pedaling, you can't actually help what happens in terms of the direction that your knee goes. A lot of you may have noticed that my knee in particular, my left knee actually tracks ridiculously to the, ridiculously to the inside. So I've got one knee going like that and the other knee doing that. It is quite natural. I think it was actually the result of one of my falls, but you can actually shift it slightly. If you uh, go and see a bike fitter, they can actually put some shims in your shoes to try and straighten things up, but it is actually quite normal. Some people have their knees out, some people have their knees in, knees in and some people are lucky enough to have a perfect sort of set of tracking, basically. Okay, next up is this from Paul Graham. Why is it when teams warm up, they have something up their nose? What is it and what effect does that do to the body? body? Well. There are several things, or two things really, that riders will put on their, up their nose or on their nose during a warm-up, generally for a warm-up for a time trial. Uh, there are things called a turbine, which is basically something that clips onto the top of your nose and opens up the airways to assist with better breathing. Some riders actually use it in the time trials themselves. Others, just it just helps them warm up to just improve the airways. Another that you'll see is riders sticking bits of cotton wool up their nose and generally they'll have some sort of menthol on there, like a Vicks or something like that, and that again helps clear the air passages, although there's no actual scientific proof it actually improves anything. But saying that, still a lot of riders use it, perhaps there's a bit of a placebo effect. Next up we have this from Gunks Hunter. How did Matt win the national championships? Sprint, break, we love you Matt. Smiley emoticon, that's nice, thanks very much Gunks. Well I actually won at the national championships by a solo break, so I did have time to sit up and enjoy the moment, but yeah, solo break. Next up is this from Owen Jones. Hi guys, have you got any tips for going on rides with slightly slower friends? Apart from the obvious benefit of them drafting you for most of the ride, of course. Thanks for all of the great videos. Thanks very much, Owen. That's a really, really good question. Um, going with slower friends, first and foremost, if they've got a light bike, maybe try going out on a heavier bike. Uh, go on, go on, on a bike with mud guards. Of course, sit on the front a lot more. Uh, another one is maybe to put on a set of heavier tires or knobbly tires, or if you've got a choice of bikes, and say for example, your friends are on a light road bike, why don't you go out and mount them up big knobbly tires? Heavier bike, more traction, just makes it a little bit more difficult. Next up is this from Brad King who asks, why are pedals you clip into called clipless pedals? Well, back in the day, the pedal system we used to use was a flat pedal with a cage and a toe strap attached, and they're actually called clips and straps. But now, we don't have clips and straps, it's just a system that's, that's based on a ski binding. Um, there was a company called Look who introduced this system back in the mid-1980s. Therefore, as there's no clips, they're called clipless. Next up, from, we have this from Midgin025. I'm not a racer, I'm just a weekend warrior, but is it okay to run tubes that have been patched. I run them between 115 and 120 psi, and I weigh 185 pounds, 84 kilos for you goofy metric people. Thanks very much. Well, that is a good question, but back in the day when I first started out and I wasn't sponsored, I had to buy all my own equipment, I did patch up a lot of my tubes. I think there are quite a few tubes running in the rinse that has kind of five or six patches on, but as long as it isn't a massive bit of damage to the inner tube, it's a small kind of puncture, and they are well patched, you take your time doing it, there's no problem at all. Finally, is this from Adihev Majuhi, who asks, what are the cons of external cabling in a more entry-level road bike? Should one hold back and invest in an internal cable bike, especially for a beginner? That is a really, really good question, but my advice would be this. On an entry-level bike, the cables are externally routed. Okay, the disadvantage, the one small disadvantage is that it's not quite as aerodynamically efficient as a more expensive bike with internally routed cables. But the advantage you will have over the internally routed cables is that they are far easier to maintain. So for an entry level bike, save a bit of money, go for externally routed cables if I were you. And actually I've got another one here, finally, from Indal Omen. Who is the woman saying it's now time for cycling shorts? Well, the answer to that question is it's Lizzie Dignan, who now drives for Bolt Dolmans, British road champion, former world champion, and former silver medalist in the Olympic Games. Well, I'm a little bit exhausted after that rather rapid, rapid fire round, uh, but we're going to slow things down. 
One more question, and it's this from Manuel W. Hey GCN, I'm from the Netherlands, but I want to train and be able to ride up hills. Now the problem is Holland is pretty flat. The biggest hills we have are speed bumps. What is the best way for me to train to go uphill? Hashtag talkback. Well, thanks very much for getting in touch with us, Manuel. Uh, it is a perennial question from those of us living in particularly flat areas. But before I throw to a video exploring this subject in a bit more detail, I do have a couple of tips which I hope will help. Now, if you've got a home trainer, um, and I've done this in the past, try stacking up the front of the home trainer so it tilts your bike to the angle that replicates your running up a hill. So a few catalogues, stack it about that much and it will actually replicate the angle of riding up a hill, although the kinetics will of course be different. And then try riding sat in the saddle but on a far lower cadence, putting a lot of torque through the pedals. That's one way. Another way is to do the same thing, so stack the front of the bike up, but use a very large gear and ride out of the saddle and do one minute intervals running as hard as you can out of the saddle using a big gear. And although it isn't perfect, it will replicate certain, certain facets of riding uphill. And another one is to get yourself a smart trainer and Zwift, which almost perfectly actually replicates riding outside on climbs, but in a virtual world. Or in addition to that, you could watch, as I mentioned before, this video here. Another option is to give yourself some extra resistance on the road. Now that could be riding around with your brakes on, although that's not something we particularly recommend, but it could also be wind. That's right, a headwind. Although often incredibly annoying, they can actually be used to improve your climbing. So if you ride into one for half an hour, you're going to be putting out some big watts at a pretty low speed. Just like climbing. Well, that's it for another edition of Ask GC Anything. Thanks very much for getting in touch with us. And please do keep those questions coming using the hashtag TalkBack down in the comment section or over on social media as well. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Global Cycling Network, it is free. Click on the globe and that way you won't miss another video. Now for a couple more videos in relation to training on climbs, how about clicking just down here for going downhill safer or specifically descending safer or click up here for how to get faster on hills without getting any fitter.